Hey programmers, welcome back. All right now, let's work on the last C exercise for functions. And so what you wanna do is pause the video, go to the link in the description, give this exercise a shot on your own. And if you get stuck, of course, I got you. Let's go over these problems together. And so I'll create myself a C functions exercise folder and I'll create a divisible JS inside. And let's start with this one together. All right, so in this one, what I wanna do is take in two numbers as arguments and return a Boolean indicating whether or not num1 is divisible by num2. So look at the first example, I'm passed in 12 and three. I should return true because 12 is divisible by three. Looking at the second example, I should return false because 12 is not divisible by five. So let's bang out this one, creating my function. So I'll take in these two arguments, num1 and num2. And to solve this one, just use modulo, right? So I'm just gonna use my arguments here. I wanna check if num1 is divisible by num2, so I can just return num1 mod num2, but I need to check if that has a remainder of zero, right? Remember that if the first number divided by the second number has a remainder of zero, then it must be divisible. To test my code, I'll bring my terminal to right inside of my C functions folder. And from there, I should be able to just run this file. So there I have it, I should have alternating true and false. There it is. Uh, what you could have also done if you wanted to was solve this one using some conditionals, in which case you're just gonna use this line as your condition. So it's a little longer, I guess. Then if num1 is visible by num2, return true, otherwise return false. And this would also be a valid solution. So let's work on this case changer problem. And so in this one, I run write a function that takes in two arguments, a string and a Boolean, and it should return the uppercase version of the string if the Boolean is true, and I should return the lowercase version of the string if the Boolean is false. So let's just take a look at the first two examples here. Now I'm given the uh, string super with a capital S, and if they pass in true, then my function should return all uppercase super. If they pass in false, I should return all lowercase super. So just some conditional logic here, it sounds like. Let's go ahead and work through this. So case change, it's gonna take in some input string and some Boolean. I'll call it just bool. And here I just wanna just check uh, what the Boolean is, right? So I'll say, hey, if the Boolean is true, then what I should do is return the totally uppercase version of the string. So just return my string turned all uppercase. So I'll be using the built-in to uppercase uh, method. Don't forget that when you call this method, you need to put parentheses, right? Otherwise, if I hit this else statement, that means that my Boolean is false. So I'll just return the two lowercase uh, version of the string. So let's run this, nothing fancy here at all, really. So these return values look good. Uh, one optimization I'll make in my code is, you will notice that my if statement is checking if the Boolean is triple equal to true. But notice that the Boolean itself is like already a Boolean value, right? It's already gonna be true or false. So technically, let's say we're stepping through the first example string is gonna be super, and bool is gonna be true, this code would be checking is true equal to true, and that is a true statement in itself. But what I could also do is just skip the comparison and just write like if bool. I'll run that, and I'll do the same exact thing. But it's a little shorter, and I think just as expressive, if maybe I possibly rename uh, this argument. So maybe instead of like bool, maybe I'll kind of denote like what it represents. So I'll say if, should uppercase, All right? So if I should uppercase the string, then return the uppercase version. Otherwise it should not uppercase, so return the lowercase version. And there I have it. So let's work through this in range problem. So in this one, I wanna take in three number arguments, min, max, and n. My function should return a Boolean indicating whether or not n is between min and max inclusive. So do understand the order of the arguments here. That's why they gave it in the description. So in this first example, my min is five, my max is 13, and n is eight. So I want to check, is eight between five and 13? That's true. In the second example, is 29 between five and 13? That's false. So I have a few arguments here to keep track of. Let me go ahead and define my function. So I'll make in range. And so I can solve this one in a single line, really. What I can do is go ahead and compare my argument n to my min number first. So I know that my n should be greater than or equal to min, right? So I'll go ahead and start writing expression. I'll say n is greater than or equal to min, right? So I'm checking if my number is greater than the min, and I should also check if my number n is less than or equal to max. This would basically say if my number n is between min and max. 
So let's go ahead and try this. So notice that here we had to use and and combine two Boolean expressions together. A uh, common mistake in JavaScript is that I see people try to write like a three way comparison. So something that you can't do in JavaScript, unfortunately, is say stuff like min is less than or equal to n is less than or equal to max. So that type of three way comparison is not valid because remember how JavaScript evaluates, right? That's why I had us work through so many of those expressions. When I have something like this, it's gonna evaluate left to right. And so it's gonna check this condition first. And this expression will evaluate to a Boolean. So it'd be a Boolean, let's say it's like true. What I'm checking is true less than or equal to max. That doesn't really make any sense, right? So you're gonna have to be complete and use and to combine two expressions. So now let's work on this average of four problem. So this one's gonna be very similar in structure to some problems we saw before, just calculating an average. So we'll just work through this one super quick. To solve this one, all you wanna do is add up all four of your arguments and then return that sum divided by four. So I'll choose to use a separate variable here just for fun. And my final answer is just this sum divided by four. Let's give this a run. Cool, and these answers look good. Now let's work through this number change problem. This one's gonna have a little more intense logic. So in this one, what I'm doing is taking in a number as an argument, and I wanna do one of two things, right? My function should return half of the number if it's an even number, or it should return double the number if it's an odd number. So let's look at the first example. Here I'm calling number change and I'm passing in six. Since six is an even number, I should return half of it, which is three. Looking at the second example, if I pass in seven, seven is an odd number, so I double it instead, return 14. So I'm gonna need some conditional logic here because I need to potentially take two different actions. So this one's straightforward. We'll just use modulo to go ahead and check that classic even or odd pattern. So I'll check if n mod two is equal to zero, that means the number is even, so I should return half of it. So just return my number divided by two. Otherwise, it must not be an even number, which means it's definitely odd. So I just wanna return double the number. So return n times two in this scenario. Let's just give that a shot. And there we have it. So now let's work on this larger problem. So in this one, my function is gonna take in two arguments and I want to return uh, the larger argument or the larger number. So I'm given 256 and 400. 400 is the bigger one, so return it. I'm given 31 and four. 31 is the larger number, so return that 31. Again, I can just solve this with some conditionals inside of a function. And so I'll just simply check, hey, if my num1 is bigger than my num2, then return num1. Otherwise, that means that my num2 is probably bigger, so I'll return num2. So I'll run this code. And there we have it, nothing fancy. Notice that here, I don't need some explicit condition to check and handle cases where like num1 is equal to num2 because they're gonna be the same number anyway. So let's say for example, I'm in a scenario where like num1 is five and num2 is five, then I know that this condition is false. So I run the else statement, which means I return num2, which is five, but it will be in five in either scenario, right? So let's work on this last contains problem. This is gonna be probably the hardest one thus far. And so in this function, we're taking in two strings and we wanna return a Boolean, indicating whether or not string two is contained within string one. And our function should also ignore any differences in capitalization. So let's make sense of this by looking at the first example. So if string one is caterpillar and string two is pill, I want to check if pill is inside of caterpillar. And that's true because it's found right about here. All right, in a similar way, I can find on inside of line share. And let's look at a scenario where we return false like this last one over here, right? Clock does not contain okay, so I return false. So let's begin by just laying down our foundation of a function. And now I'll have to think of a strategy for solving this one. Well, I know I have some strings, so I'll think about any operations I can use with strings, and hopefully the index of method comes to mind. So I can use index of and some comparison to check if a string is within another string. In particular, what I can do is I'll grab string one. String one is the larger string, and so I want to search through string one for string two. So what I'll do is call string one dot index of string two. And what this expression by itself will tell me is what's the index where string two can be found inside of string one, right? I know that if string two is actually found inside of string one, then I get an invalid index, which would be a number greater than negative one. If it's not there, I would get exactly negative one because negative one is not a valid index. So at this point, what I'll do is I'll check if that is greater than negative one. So this expression, this total expression, evaluates to true 
if string two is contained in string one. And so for now, let's go ahead and just return this value. We'll see what we get. This will be pretty close. So we're getting true, true, and three false. And so it looks like we're failing this middle example. And if you recall, the question actually stated our function should ignore any differences in capitalization. So that's why we're failing this one because we're looking for lowercase or inside of sorry. And so to get around this, I need to make sure that my function can still recognize things even if they have different cases. So what I can do is get rid of the difference in capitalization, right? Instead of using the original string one and string two in my little searching pattern over here, maybe I'll convert both of them to lowercase, let's say. You could have also probably converted them to uppercase. So I'll create a variable, I'll call it my lower string one, and I'll get the lowercase version of string one, so two lowercase. And I'll do something symmetric for lower string two. All right, so I have a lowercase version of both of my strings. Now I'm guaranteed to have no difference in capitalization. And I'll conduct my index of pattern with those two variables now. And with that change, let's give this example a run again. Nice, and there we have it. All right, so that's the full walkthrough for this C exercise for functions. What you'll wanna do is go through all of these problems again if you had trouble with them. Make sure you can solve them on your own, and in the next one, we'll learn a new topic.